All right. Hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Jilin, and well, I'm the organizer of this. Thanks, <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me skip this slide. So, <laughs> yep. So, uh, well, what we do at Women Who Code, right? Um, we are a meetup group essentially, and what we want to do is we want to um, help uh, women in the industry basically excel in your technology careers, right? That's what we do, and we want to be able to network with each other in sessions such as this, so that you know uh, more like-minded people out, people out there, and you can discuss, you know, all the issues that we can't discuss with guys at work, of course, <laughs> <laughs> right? So. We have um, not just our meetup group, but we also have a website as well. Um, our email address is there if you have any questions you want to ask us about. Um, we have a Facebook group, we have a Slack, and of course, uh, we also have a mailing list. Uh, we haven't um, broadcasted that uh, recently, uh, yep. but we do have a mailing list, and I tend to do an a email uh, telling you about events such as this. Yeah? Some of you have um, got the invitation through the mailing list. And yeah, we also do events such as this, and we are always uh, on the lookout for speakers because we would like to encourage more speakers to step up and speak. So if you would like to do a session with us, whether it's um, you want to do your own panel, feel free to approach us as well. Or if you want to do your own workshop or give a talk on a certain topic, feel free to let us know and we'll organize everything for you. Okay. And thank you um, to Facebook. This is our Facebook page, so do join us. So it's pretty fun. I always uh, put out uh, interesting information that uh, some of you might like to know about uh, on there as well. So, yep. And in preparation for our uh, Connect conference, so. This year in August, 31st of August, we are doing a Wimho Code Connect Asia. This will be the first one of its kind um, tech conference in Asia. And our goal is to make sure we that we have more female speakers than men. So <laughs> if any of you have ever been to a tech conference, one of the biggest problems is there's no female speakers or not enough of them, right? So our goal, if we can get more female speakers than men, we have reached our goal, we have shown that, you know, we can speak. It doesn't have to be a guy. All right. So do submit a, call for, um, do submit a proposal for the uh, Women of Code Connect Asia. It's on the 31st uh, of August. It's a Saturday. It'll be fun to come down. All right. And if you are a speaker, you get a free ticket. Will it be happening in any of the locations that you have mentioned? It will be happening in Singapore. Yep, it will be in Singapore. And we have organizers from these five different countries, basically the five different um, cities in Asia. We are collaborating together to make this happen in Singapore. So the first one here will be Singapore. Next year, we might have it in Kuala Lumpur. But you know, this year is going to be in Singapore, so uh, make the best of the, uh, this chance that we're doing it in Singapore. Submit the CFP. It will be great. Great stuff. All right. OK, yep. So. Just to recap a bit, in the past two years, we have already um, we have organized quite a number of events in the past two years. I think we have hit uh, more than 100 um, sessions, meetup sessions, and that's really great. That was really cool. So, on of applause, everybody. <laughs> that is great. And we have lots of different sessions. We have the hackathon last year, of course. Um, yep. Speaker sessions, workshops, panels all this, and these are great stuff. See if you can catch yourself in any of these photos. Yep, Shermin is, uh, has went, and now she's working in New York. Hui Jing is an uh, organizer of um, JSConf. Lydia is still a director at um, KL, Women Who Code. Yep, so again, uh, just to remind everybody, we are doing this on the 31st of August submit a CFP, and hopefully um, through the panel session tonight, uh, you'll learn more about being a speaker and you'll step up. If you want, feel free to you know, um, do a try round on one, any one of our meetups if you don't want to jump straight to a tech conference. You know, just do a meetup with us first, and then you can do it on the tech conference floor, right? We'll be your guinea pig. We want to thank Facebook for doing this for us, for um, collaborating and organizing such a great event, celebrating IWD. And 
Hay lắm, hay lắm. She will give a few words about Facebook. Thank, Thank you. you Hi, good evening, ladies, and happy International Women's Day. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I have a question. How many of you? It's your first time um, at Facebook today. First time ever. Wow. Okay, we need to do more of this. <laughs> How many of you? It's your first time celebrating International Women's Day. <laughs> of course, right. Okay, some of you, some, some people. Yes. Okay, great first experience. How many of you came here for the food? To be honest, the donut wall was amazing. Okay, I see hands <laughs> going out the back. <laughs> Regardless of why you came, we are so happy you're here and we're so, so honored and so happy that we can, you know, really host this event today. So I just wanted to quickly share a little bit about, you know, what we do and who I am. So my name is Kayla. I lead diversity programs at Facebook. Um, outside my day job, I am also a co-lead for community partnerships with our Women at Facebook network. So you can tell I'm big on community. I love community. And I think it's so important that all of us come together in one place where you know we can make each other stronger. And together, we really are stronger together. So Facebook as a company, like why are we doing this today? Why do we want to host Women Who Code? We love community and to be honest, like today I had like three events um, in the other building. If you follow our Facebook Live Instagram page, you will see we've been hosting events with Lean In, He For She and today right now we have Women Who Code. And this is our mission. Our mission is very simple. We want to bring the world closer together. We want to give people, you guys, you ladies, the power to build community. And that's important to us as a company. And so today, you know, we're so happy to host you, all of you here and we hope that through this community of Women Who Code, we'll all be stronger together. Thank you. So without further ado, let me introduce our amazing panel. To please come up and then really you can take it from here. Welcome. Great stuff. Okay. It's okay. All right. So thank you. Um, if you can find your name, if you can sit accordingly, that would be Best. So if uh, oh, Vanessa can okay. sit, so that um, the Vanessa, you have to yeah. sit here. We don't have enough seats. Oh, that's okay. Then I'll I'll I'll, I'll sit on the. Okay. I'll sit here. That's okay. <laughs> so I think we have it, more or less. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> PGIR for everyone. Great stuff. All right. We have Vanessa. Uh, so I think you guys can read. So Vanessa, Rampreet, Aditi, Bean, Amanda, and Samana. These are great, 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 great uh, panelists we have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, the names, you can read the names quite okay. Lovely, great stuff. So first off, um, we are doing this panel to basically tell your experience ab uh, about speaking at a women code session and also your experience speaking in general. And hopefully um, some of these girls can uh, gain some of the insights from you and maybe even speak soon. Um, so very quickly, do you mind um, basically tell us a little bit about how you started speaking for Women Who Code. So um, I run a nonprofit called XR Alliance and also the virtual reality women group in Asia. Um, and I like to get more women in tech into virtual reality. And I hear a lot of women saying, oh, it's really hard to learn new technologies. Um, but uh, I say, you know, why don't you just start somewhere? Uh, come and join our meetups. Um, and uh, Yulin has been great as well, building this community here. And she's been persuading me to talk about WebXR. Um, so, and that's how I got started. Hi, um, I'm Rampreet. Um, I took a break from work in 2017, and uh, I got to know about this meetup um, in my inbox. And uh, I came to meet, I saw a group of ladies building a mobile app. I found it to be very inspiring, and uh, that's how I developed my interest in joining this. And uh, I did two sessions, one was on Scrum and the other was on Git. Uh, very helpful. I'm great to be part of this community. Thank you. 
Uh, hello everyone. Hi, my name is Aditi. Um, I actually started uh, becoming part of Women Who Code. Uh, I met uh, Sulin actually, uh, Yulin actually, at one of the events where there were like uh, nine to ten year olds uh, trying to learn Python. Like they were really little girls, and like I saw them code. I saw the kind of um, the passion they had to understand what was going on with an integer and a variable, and that that kind of told me that you know there's just so many people who want to learn when they're so young and uh, like some of them were telling me that you know they are still told that it's probably you know science is not for them or it might be too hard and you know things like that which I thought was very very uh, shocking uh, and I thought if I can you know go tell them that it's okay they can try it out for themselves and see if uh, if that's what they like and go ahead I think um, that would mean a lot to me so that's how I got here and yeah did a talk Hi, my name is Bin, and I started to code because uh, I started to speak because Yulin asked me to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So honestly, like uh, I think um, it was like I think last year um, there's an event, there's another uh, another Facebook event that is called Powerful Women in Tech, and then that's where I met Yulin, and then I was showing her like, oh, I'm really interested in like animation in CSS and stuff, and show her what, what I'm doing, and then she was like, oh, do you want to speak uh, about CSS? And then I was like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable, but I'll do it anyway, because I, I want to grow. So that's why I started on this journey. So for me, it's like a growth journey. Like, and I, I do encourage y'all, if she ever asks you or you just like, approach her to you know, speak up, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda. So I was uh, just talking to Bain earlier on. I, I said the same thing. I just say yes to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, so I, was, I did talk about uh, cloud technology. So I'm basically working a lot of. Uh, I'm working. To, I was working towards my uh, solution architecture for AWS. So I thought it was a good way to kind of revise and go through. Because once you speak out to the public, uh, you kind of uh, go through all the things you have in your, your mentally. You don't even need to refer to your notes that much. You have, you know it inside, in and out. So that was a good way to to get uh, the experience. Yeah. Uh, my name is Samana. I am a mobile developer. Uh, I met Yulene in one of the social coding session and uh, I like the whole concept of that they're open to um, people from different backgrounds to learn. Uh, and they are they want peop more people to hold some workshops. So I approached her and shared my interest that I wanted to share my knowledge with people. My, and we held together and she helped me for the first iOS workshop for Women Who Can Code. Lovely, great stuff, great stuff. Thank you. Um, what is it for each of you? I think some of you you have a different um, uh, different incentive to become a speaker. Any of you have something different? Okay, uh, I can go. Um, I think uh, one of the things uh, when I started speaking publicly, I realized that it's a very um, difficult experience. It makes you quite nervous. And um, I think at that point, you can make a call as to whether you know, you're not going to do it because it's hard or because you feel like that, or you can take it the other way. That Now I think about it, like because I'm nervous, that means I'm doing something challenging and something important. So I'm like, okay, you know I, what? I want to do it because it's just harder than not doing it. So I think that's kind of how I would uh, get into this and try and come out and share my ideas. Yeah. And with any okay. different reason you're speaking? Uh, so I guess also, um, so I just came back from a conference as well. So uh, I think Trisha, I, at least there's really interesting uh, career advice from this uh, Trisha Gee from JetBrains. So she was saying, uh, a lot of people talk about being 10 times programmers, you're, you, you'll be rock star developers and stuff. But uh, if you really want to scale your skills, you have to share them. So I think if you're speaking and sharing with other people, yeah, it's gonna, uh, that's actually one step towards helping a lot. Your, your team grow bigger, your, oh, your company grow bigger, and the community grow bigger as well. So. To me, I feel that um, writing, I have a writer's mind, um, but I also find that as I started learning, I find speaking is a good outlet for me to reinforce what I'm learning and sharing out to the industry as well. And the best thing is so I get to meet like-minded people. And to me, growing my network, um, to find mentors as well, as well as help others, that's the motivation for me. Great stuff. So how much time do you spend preparing for a talk or a workshop? Depend on uh, what kind of a workshop it is. If it's like a uh, more like a deep tech 
which you're not really familiar with that you have to uh, gain in research or have enough knowledge that you can speak and if something that you are very strong in it then I think lesser time so depend on the topic you have chosen or what kind of a workshop it is you have to prepare accordingly Anybody interested to know a ballpark figure on how long they spend preparing <laughs> for a workshop? No? Okay, I can say okay. that I, I spent 27 years. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Because I mean like uh, for me right, knowledge is something that you build years upon years and like once you get familiar with it right, um, any moment um, it has to come out. Uh. So I think that like uh, for me, um, I build my knowledge, I really study my stuff and like I make sure that I know, understand, I understand it well. But then to be honest, to prepare for a workshop, right, I think it will be about two, three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, to add to Bin's point, um, I usually take up topics which I have hands-on experience on. Um, so it takes for me around four to five hours spread over a couple of weeks. So that is a ballpark figure, I think. Thank you. I, I seem to be the outlier. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm just uh, too busy at work. <laughs> But uh, I think I spent about the weekend before, at least at least a couple of days. I think that's bare minimum because you need to go through all your material and stuff. True. So but yeah. you did, um, is there a difference like doing a talk or a workshop? Uh, I think workshop is a bit different because uh, you have to kind of prepare your, uh, make sure the materials that people are participating, they actually understand as well. Whereas in a talk, you're, it's still more of a one-to-many, whereas in a workshop, you're working back and forth. So I think a workshop definitely takes a lot more time than a, than a talk, right? Yeah. Well, for me, when I do an industry talk about the virtual reality trends, it takes me about one month to actually go through all the points for the 20 over slides or so. so. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So through um, your experience being a speaker, so there's, is there a lot of difference? Any of you find a lot of difference giving a talk? I mean, other than what you have spoken. And what is it? What was the one thing that surprises you, whether given it's a talk or a workshop? something that you've never thought about before being um, a speaker? Um, I think I think one thing that uh, when I didn't used to do that much public speaking was like I got used to get a lot of advice. Like you should try to be confident. You should try to say the right things and, you know, maybe crack a few jokes that would help lighten the atmosphere. But I think uh, one thing that surprised me was like people like to see you yourself. Like they connect with you the most um, while you're talking or whatever you're sharing when you're just being yourself and just uh, sharing the thoughts that they want to listen, but at the same time understanding where they're coming from and then sharing those ideas that way. So I think that was quite surprising for me that it's not so much about the confidence or not even about the highly technical content. It's about understanding what the audience wants and um, just being honest about it. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was... Um learning that uh, it is not just what I share, there is a big learning that I get out of these sessions. So when I did a session on Scrum, um, there, were a, there was a QA session whereby many participants shared the challenges they face in adopting Scrum. So that kind of insights, they enriched me and they, I took them, them back to my work and that really helped me. For me, the fact that I get chosen to be um, to be in front of people are actually is a um, is a surprise by itself. To be honest, because like you know, like when I go for a meeting, uh, when I go for a talk, and then I see like all this lady, all this speaker that is up there, and then I was like, wow, never be there. <laughs> yeah, and then like just one day, like you know, out of nowhere, I'm, I'm just an ordinary person, but then like you know, Willin asked me, oh, do you wanna do it or not? And I decided to step out of the comfort zone, and I realized that it's. Um, the se like the first time is scary, but the second time, the third time, it was better. So yeah. Yes, I feel that uh, as you start speaking, if you do it the first time and you continue at it, it might be really daunting. But uh, you find that you start to lead uh, your projects, you're better as well as the industry, and again you get to meet um, like-minded people. So. What was the one biggest challenge you have to overcome to be a speaker? 
I think for the when you are having your first workshop, then it's a bit difficult. Like, uh, you can see you get more nervous and you think, okay, whether I would be able to communicate and share my knowledge in a very simpler way because this woman of quit is open for all. So the first initial challenge, which I thought that I need to be very simple. Uh, so that even a person who doesn't belong to a tech background can understand and can build that project with me. So I was nervous initially, and when I had the experience of working them, then it was easy. Uh, I think for me, uh, again, it's always a nervous speaking <laughs> habit, I think. Uh, actually, I did. Especially when Yuri was asking, I was like, okay, it's uh, just a crowd of strangers, maybe I'll never see any of you, uh, me again. <laughs> And it's fine, <laughs> but I do see a lot of familiar faces today, so uh, I think it's uh, at least that's helping as well. Then after I did, I gave the talk. I actually went back to my office and said, "Okay, uh, I told my boss. So actually, I did do a talk the other day, <laughs> and then I actually did show my colleagues. And I said, my, my boss was like, "Oh, so why didn't you like show in front of us before that? Because I was still really nervous about it. So, but it helped a lot. That's as, as Bin was saying, uh, and you know, just practice, and then you get the uh, the injections, the current <laughs> booster shots." So. Stuff like that. I think it's really um, really brave of all of you just to do the first step and <laughs> do the first speech. That was great stuff. I, I feel that women who code meetups and events are fantastic because you actually learn something concrete and not just talk about um, you know what the issues or challenges, but you're building something. So it's a fantastic community. Thank you. Okay. So from this, right, do you gain anything from being a speaker? Any you know extra opportunities that comes your way just because you have spoken in public? We usually don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like you know from from doing this right, um, I get to reinforce my uh, my like I need to understand before I work, prepare for the workshop right. Before I come for the workshop, I make sure that I understand the concept well, and in in uh, and while I'm doing that right, I learn more and I become more confident. I can defend my points. I get more respect. I get more credibility. So it translates out into like you know when I go for interview for a clients project for example, then uh, when I go for those kind of interview right, I'm more confident. I have I have things to show them. Like instead of saying like oh uh, I know CSS, I know Angular, I know React, I tell them that oh I conduct a workshop in this in that. Yeah. So in in doing all that right, I think like it's beneficial for me to grow as a you know to grow into like the, into the role that I wanted. So. Okay, definitely it gave me a lot of visibility through speaking in women who can code. Uh, now I'm more confident. I, whenever I'm, I, you know, in a way it has helped me throughout my startup journey and throughout the meeting different people. And plus when you are holding a workshop, I realized that you learn from people who are making, who are with you in that journey a lot. Then you, it seems like you are teaching them something, but you learn from them a lot that, okay, this thing, I need to work on it from the questions and stuff. So it keeps you motivated. Um, I also feel that uh, as women start to speak at the technical events or industry events, you again get to build the credibility and you get to also um, build a career and rise up in management senior rank positions. And I think we need more women in management levels, especially technical women. Um, I see a lot of uh, social media experts um, <laughs> coming to the industry and saying that, you know, this is what the industry is about. But I think we really, really need more technical women out there. So, let's see. Um, what is the one thing you wish you had known before you had spoken? Before, you know, you become a speaker? Well, one thing you should know. Yeah, you wish you had known. Um, I think uh, one thing that I wish I had known before um, I went and spoke was like when I was preparing for my material, I thought like I have to be the um, uh, know everything about the topic that I'm presenting or I have to be the smartest in the room about the domain that I am or I should know everything about, you know, whatever I'm presenting because it could be that they ask me something and then I'm like, okay, you know, uh, maybe I have to check. Uh, but I think one thing I've realized is that probably that's not needed, like 
we are all here to learn and I'm just presenting an idea. And as everyone said that during the event, we realized from the questions that there's so much more to do. So I think uh, one of the things I wish I knew was that I don't have to kill myself over understanding everything about the domain that I'm presenting. Like it's a matter of uh, being in the same room, sharing ideas, and then uh, just learning from each other. So I think a lot of people don't take it because they're like, okay, if I'm the speaker, I'm the center of attention, like I should know everything about what I'm presenting. Uh, so I think that was uh, something that we don't need to know, yeah. So I agree with uh, what she just said. I had the same fear that um, unless, I mean, how can I become a public speaker if I'm not expert in a particular topic? But think about it, when you want to learn a new topic, you don't know that topic at an expert level. Now, I have knowledge about Java, but if there is a session on, let's say, Python, what is my aim? My aim is to maybe bring myself up from zero to, let's say, five to six level out of 10. So the speaker doesn't need to be expert Expert, but rather the speaker should have the ability to bring the audience from zero to let's say five or six average level. So that was a surprising thing I learned through this. Definitely, I agree exactly to you ladies. I wish I would be uh, would have been less fearful and thought that okay, I should not be less hard on myself that it's gonna be fine and so. So one thing I learned is that I wish I should have done this much earlier, like 10 years ago. <laughs> so it's never too late to start. Start now. So it's great stuff that, you know, to learn that it, it doesn't have to be stressful at all. Yeah. 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 It's no, no such thing as perfection and yeah. definitely no such thing as perfect speaker. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any advice you have for the floor, for the members? Um, I, I kind of anticipated this question. Um, I would say one of the things would be that just just start small. Uh, like I think for me, I started with just doing like a presentation for my team. Uh, just telling them, you know, that I've been reading about this thing outside of work. Like I would just like to share, get your opinion on what you feel about it. So I think it's good to start somewhere. Uh, for me, it helped that I shared it with the people I knew and like felt a lot more comfortable. So I think start somewhere. And the other thing I would say is that, um, yeah, I mean, uh, just try it out. Uh, you might feel it's not for you or you feel quite nervous. But again, like uh, when you are in that uncomfortable zone is where you will try to push yourself and become a better version of yourself. So I think just keep that in mind that it's okay to be nervous and just still do it. Yeah. Uh, I think that don't have any mental barrier or stuff like, you know, if you don't have a certain skill or certain um, experience, if you want to learn something, I think Women of Good Code is the best opportunity. It gives you, it's open for all, anybody from any point of time they are in life, they can start learning and pursuing and do the stuff they want to do. Yeah, for me, it would just um, just do it because I remember like um, the Virgin Ally CEO, he actually say like, um, even if you don't know how to do it, uh, if, if, if the person present to you the opportunity, just just take it and figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So actually today, like, you know, before I joined this, right, when, when you really asked me, I was like, oh, I never do a panel before. And it's so scary. And like, all the ladies are like so high up there and like, so established. Like, what am I going to do? Yeah. But then um, I decided like, okay, I'm just going to commit to it first and then I'll figure it out later. Lah. So maybe you can do the same thing as well. Yeah. All right. One last question before we open to, uh, for Q&A. Right. <laughs> what is any, any of these? What is the best question you have ever answered in a Q&A or the worst question you have ever gotten <laughs> in a Q&A? I think one of the best questions that I've been asked is like, um, you know, uh, where can I start? Uh, and I think that is very good because it gives the audience as well as the person who asked the question the ability to know that, you know, you can start at anywhere, whether it's a technical concept. So I remember like I was talking about building a chatbot for one of my talks and like the person stood up and she's like, okay, I've only played with chatbots, like, you know, where can I start? And I, I think that question really helps because it, that's in the minds of a lot of people who are there in the audience. Like, okay, you know, you're presenting this technical concept to me. Um, sounds good, like, but where do I start? So I think um, 
uh, that was something that I thought was good for me to share my experience and also make the audience feel like, you know, sometimes the concepts we're discussing might be very technical. You might not have knowledge about it, but there are places you can begin and start your journey. So I think that, that for me is like one of the best questions to get the audience to feel like we all can do it. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, when I when you work on a lot of cloud stuff and then you hear the marketing, people will be like, oh, you know, it's just a few lines of code. You can just put in there and then you run and then it work. So someone was asking me, <laughs> so I think they were asking something like, uh, uh, is it really or is it really so simple as that much code? So I had to, I mean, it is, sometimes it is as easy as that much code, but you always have to remember you're building on top of other people's work. So there's uh, layers on layers and layers. You're just as long as you do something new, you're adding to the knowledge around us as well, and then we can all be on that as well. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good question, I think. Um, I have a question once before, um, when I'm on stage and somebody come uh, come back, come out to me when I'm off the stage and say, who do you think you are to you know, lead the industry or, or say these things about the industry? And I say, well, um, I think I'm able to do it. Why can't why can't um, you know, a woman do it? It doesn't matter. I mean, And sometimes it's also really... Um, because it's International Women's Day, I never really reflected um, how it actually affected me being a woman. Um, I thought that it's just usual, um, get go out and do things. But I do think subconsciously how people perceive me on stage as a woman. And I didn't know how much, actually, uh, whether I can be myself, um, humorous, or be in a professional setting. How would they perceive me? So that's always in the back of my mind. So that's been a challenge for some time, too. So for the sessions I did, um, I want to thank everyone who asked uh, the questions because there isn't one single best question. It's the discussion that stimulates further discussion. And um, some questions that I may not personally like are the questions for which I didn't have the answer because that was a pivotal point from me becoming a speaker, sharing my knowledge to become someone who knows, who becomes more self-aware and knows the gaps in the knowledge and can go and get better about them. Yeah. That's great stuff. All right, any questions from the floor? We'll get the best and worst questions now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can. <coughs> so you wanted to, have, you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much for sharing all this. That was really interesting. Um, I'm, I'd like to know how you find a topic to talk about because personally, I quite like doing talks or I would like to do more talks, but then I don't really know what to talk about. So yeah, what? how do you find a topic? Uh, I think we initially start with something which is you are interested in, which you are passionate about it. Uh, for st for starting, in my opinion, you should do something which you, you think you are good at and you have knowledge of it and you're passionate about speaking about that topic. So something is related to area of your interest, maybe. I'm not sure. It's, it's each to everyone. One thing I can really suggest, if you are passionate about a particular charity, to volunteer your time speaking about that cause. Um, and that actually, when you have the passion lead you, it actually makes it easier to think about what to talk about and yeah, be out there speaking about it. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, also, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have any tips how is to encourage your audience like sometimes do you feel like audience is boring what should they do what should i do what should i do <laughs> all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very really challenging i would say yes it's not just we crack jokes and people have poker faces right so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so there was what this do you do? <laughs> very interesting session that i did actually at facebook <laughs> itself where the audience was a bit too diverse it was just very diverse and they the three um, speaker sessions during that session was one on mobile, one on web, and mine, I was talking about data science and agile. So, and most of the audience, they were not uh, from the same field. Some are web developers, some are backend developers, a few data scientists, um, some practice agile, maybe not. And when I asked the question on, you know, who's actually uh, practicing agile or who's a data scientist, like maybe two or three hands popped up. 
And that was scary for me. I was like, what? What am I doing here? <laughs> right? But so I, I just plowed through the talk and basically just um, went, went through it uh, because I realized that you know, not everybody is going to be interested in um, listening to the talk itself. I just plowed through it. But surprisingly, after the talk, a few of the people actually approached me and said, oh, they really appreciate you know, that I actually given the talk. And that was quite surprising for me. So it doesn't really matter whether or not um, your audience look bored, actually. You'll be surprised. They are actually quite attentive. Yeah, I think one of the things that I would generally do, like if I feel like I'm losing my audience or probably I'm either going too fast or too slow or uh, maybe I'm just being too technical for the audience or maybe less technical because that's also a challenge, right? Like people who are already in the industry might find like, okay, that's just touching on the surface. Like I could have found that on Google. Like, so I think you kind of have to gauge the pulse of the audience as well. Sometimes I would just ask some questions like how uh, she was talking about, like maybe just like what's your experience level just so that they feel like, okay, you know, uh, the fact that they're there, that's being accounted for. So yeah, just take a pause, just ask some questions questions or maybe um, I think for one of the smaller events I even took it to the place where you can just ask them to stand up and maybe you know introduce themselves and then take it from there and make it more of a discussion rather than just me talking so I think there are various ways to do it it really depends on the audience as well like for such a crowd it might be very hard to do it like if you guys are disinterested <laughs> but it would it would get easier if it's a smaller crowd so I think you really have to gauge it like asking them some questions understanding their experience level and also maybe I think something that usually works is that if I have some videos or demos to show then I'll just bring them up early on like in my earlier slides rather than me going through the theory or the the approach I've taken to solve that problem I'll just bring up the solution up front uh, so that people know okay so this is what she built okay now let's understand how she built it so sometimes you just have to maybe tweak it a little bit what you would have planned um, and yeah I guess that that would be the way to go yeah yeah, so I do workshop, right? Then, like, you know, like, I try to be scary also. So I walk down one round, then I check, like, oh, you do already or not? Oh, you do already or not? Yeah, those kind of things. So I guess, like, finding out, like, how people are, like, what level they are, and, like, are they doing the thing? Are they bored or not? Ask them questions. I think that would help. Yeah. Uh, I think I didn't, I haven't really done any workshops. But I've been, I helped out, I've been workshop helpers. And I think like you said, I, I think it just helps to go around and make sure, because some people uh, don't really want to say uh, they have a problem. So it's easier to go one-on-one -on -one with them as well. Yeah, Yeah. same. Yeah, be interactive, go on and see everybody is able to produce and we be, be with you on the workshop. So most of the tech topics uh, can seem boring to people who are not from a technical background. Uh, one trick that can help sometimes is to just prepare um, uh, to have a bit of try to inject a bit of sense of humor if you can in the in the whole group. Uh, I think that helps to sometimes awaken the audience. Uh, yeah, so I was also just telling them, uh, again, with about a non-technical background, because, I mean, uh, I do work in a non-technical company. So they were, we were doing some tech awareness and stuff like that, so we were go around. It was actually a really big crowd. It was like very long room. <laughs> it's very hard to look around, especially a setting. But uh, And then I think a lot of it is like, even if they are not of a tech background, you kind of can still relate to their everyday life, especially nowadays. I mean, everyone has a phone, everyone has Facebook, so you just kind of bring the concepts to them. And uh, I, I think it works very well with analogies and metaphors rather than just uh, dry tech talk sometimes, yeah. Any other questions? Um, hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question. So my name is Sarah. So thank you so much for sharing your views around public speaking. Um, I had a question also for Yue Lin, also for the rest, because Yue Lin said that she brought you guys onto the panel and asked some of you to become speakers. Um, what is your advice around how do you bring people around you to become more um, ready to speak? I mean, I don't want to force anyone, but I've seen like people around me who are really, really good. And I said to them a few times, like, oh, you should totally speak at this thing. And then they're always like, no, no, I don't want. And it's gone, gone on for like a year. <laughs> but mm -hmm. How do I get more people into the fold of getting into the action of speaking more? Right. Yeah. How I do it. <laughs> uh, you I call them, Yulene. Yeah, I get, <laughs> them, get her I get number. Them, I get them to commit to a date. So I literally, yeah. I just bring out my diary and say, what about next week, Thursday? <laughs> I, 
I think that <laughs> works in uh, life as well. Just you get people commit to a date. <laughs> Yeah. I say, oh yeah, um, let's let's how about next next month, you know, next month, you know, we are not doing anything special in this particular week. How about Thursday? Would Wednesday work better for you? <laughs> let's see. Yeah, and I think one of the other things that I feel uh, helps, uh, especially when she was asking me to speak at an event, was she was like, um, like you, you have the ability to choose a topic, so uh, you can decide what you want to speak about. Uh, you can decide how technical would it be. Like there were like really no constraints that I was working with, so that was encouraging because uh, if she was like, okay, we are looking for machine learning speakers only, then I'm like, okay, you know, I've done a bit of it, but. I don't know if I'm eligible to speak about it. So I think just uh, letting people around you know that, you know, it's not about being really good at what you're going to speak or knowing, you know, again, being an expert at it, but just making them feel comfortable that people are there to hear you, to just understand your perspective. I think that helps. The other thing that I really found pushed me to public speaking was watching a lot of tech talks. Like I was just amazed with how those people used to impart ideas. And like, I remember watching so many tech talks and feeling like, wow, like, you know, I've been influenced. My life has been transformed after watching those. And I, I, I feel like, you know, if I can do that to somebody, that's really motivating for me. So like, if I'm able to convince someone or just have some sort of impact on their lives, uh, simply by presenting my idea, I think that's a big motivator for me. So just letting people know that it's free form, you can choose what you want to speak about, and also tell them that even the small amount of impact you can create can go a long way. I think that really helps people ease out and, you know, volunteer themselves to speak up. Yeah, I think it's also quite similar with um, all our experiences where the first talk is always the most daunting, right? So there's always uh, various different types of talks out there, not just a, a full-length 30-minute um, talk with remote code. But there's also lightning talks in a lot of tech conferences. They do lightning talks as well. And we might, uh, actually, I might consider doing a lightning talk session where I can just grab as many sign-ups as possible and can talk for five minutes. Um, there's other meetups groups, not just uh, remote code. Uh, there's junior dev, there's um, other uh, talk CSS, and I think they don't have one recently, but they used to have a um, hack and tell session where you only talk for 10 minutes and you only have 10 minutes and you have to stop at 10 minutes. So that's quite interesting as well. So it doesn't have to be a full length talk. Yeah, one of the other things I can remember is like uh, I was asking someone to be a public speaker, like just to share their ideas because I thought they were very interesting. And then I just uh, let him know that, you know what, like you finish your talk and then during the Q&A, we both will be there and take the questions together. Because sometimes like they feel like, you know, maybe the Q&A section can be quite daunting. Okay, what will the will the crowd ask me? So I just made them feel better saying that, okay, we'll just take it together. Like we'll see as the questions come in, like one of us can volunteer. And you are you are also feel free just to tell them that, you know, I don't know and we can get back or something like that. So that kind of gives them the comfort level, okay. Uh, because some people are like, okay, what can they ask me, right? So I think just being comfortable with saying I don't know is fine. Like we, you're not expected to know everything. Definitely, you can always share a session, basically. saying I'm willing to, um, do a cold talk yeah. with you. I think um, Charlotte had a similar experience talking uh, interview with uh, your colleague, yeah? Um, hi to the panel and everybody here. Um, so actually, I have my first big talk on Monday. I'm delivering a talk at NTU as an alumnus. And um, I'm actually looking for some advice. Um, so I'm going to be addressing a crowd of about, I think, 300 people. And I'm super nervous. Um, so I noticed that uh, all of you here are from different uh, tech backgrounds and at different stages of your career. Um, it would be great if you could maybe share one advice each uh, that I could carry home and pass it on to my audience when I did over the talk. <laughs> yeah, wh what's the talk about, sorry? <laughs> so uh, I'm addressing the school of Tripoli, um, undergrad and postgrad students. So it could be some advice which just helps someone new, someone fresh in their careers. These are tech students. Yes. 
Okay, that would be, I, I would give you a very stereotype advice, but that works, if, you know, whenever you just follow your passion. If you're passionate about something, you are interested in learning that and pursuing your career in that, then even if you don't know a few things, you will be able to learn it and you will be able to enjoy and give up things for the things you love doing. So definitely, in, if you're passionate about doing technical stuff follow that but if you think you don't feel happy doing programming then don't do it so it's like it's not like for everyone no pressure yeah so it's that's it <laughs> um, I would say that probably if you're addressing like um, students um, one of the things to to, that would be good would be to use some examples from your workplace if possible like maybe take it back to your experience you said you're an alumni and how you really felt uh, maybe start there like because especially when we just graduate out and we are looking for opportunities there's a lot of you know apprehension and nervousness with where we'll get in what will happen to your careers and then just tell them that in the long term it wouldn't matter as much as you think it would like uh, so I mean I guess just take it back to where they come from like like just put yourself in their shoes like when I was thinking about today's event also I was like okay what if I had never spoken before and I was sitting in the crowd what would I want them to say like I don't want them to say that it's not for everyone or I don't want them to say that you need you need years of preparation till you can become a speaker right because that's going to be discouraging and that's not true either so I think it would be uh, helpful if you can just visualize yourself as one member in the audience and imagine that if I had an alumni who was coming in to speak to me, what would kind of made me feel good, but at the same time, uh, get me well prepared uh, for whatever I'm gonna do next. So I think that's usually how I decide what to cover, really. Yeah, yeah all of us have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Again, no pressure. <laughs> So I did a similar talk uh, in a secondary school um, uh, where I was sharing um, my thoughts on choosing a career in IT industry. And it's surprising that uh, many of the students, they don't understand much about what technology is all about. Um, so one thing that I example I gave them was about smart nation. Singapore is all set to become smart nation and there is a lot of videos and documentation on internet um, which talks about how uh, the government plans to set up the sensors across the island, get the data, analyze that data and make smart decisions on that basis. So if you could somehow condense that in few minutes and share with them, I think it would help them. Yeah, I think I can relate well to the student. Yeah, you know, because um, I think like I'm in, when I'm still in my year four, I still don't know what I'm going to do. Like I really don't know. Year four, same one, I was like, oh, am I going to be a developer? Am I going to be a project manager? What am I going to do? And then I guess like uh, at that time, right, um, there's this module that like, uh, there's this module like called IDP. So it's about like doing prototyping. And I realized that I didn't even have to try. I'm good at it by natural. So I discover like where I want to go like in the very last sem of my entire four years. And I mean like just maybe for them, uh, for me back then, right, if somebody would have tell me like it's okay, like you don't have it, you don't have it together, you don't figure it out, it's fine. It's eventually you'll figure it out. Yeah, and like maybe just um, ask them to stay open and hopeful that one day you like you find something that you really like. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I guess I will say something about uh, maybe just go beyond your comfort zone. It's not necessary that you need to. If you're happy, your comfort zone maybe. I mean, that's fine. Or so, but uh, the only way to grow is to move beyond it. If not, you're just limiting yourself. I think ten years ago, if I was thinking, oh, I'll be staying where I am now, I'm. <laughs> but I mean, as in, it's the, the, I mostly regret the choice I don't make rather than as in if I don't even try for it, let alone those I actually did. I, I made the decision to go for it. So I think that's one of the key learnings, lessons to learn. I think the ability to uh, relate to people, the team, the colleagues around you, it's super important. It's not just about studies and technology. So, yeah. Yep. And I think. Um, during that period before they actually go into the industry, um, they might not realize that this is one industry you have to keep learning after you graduate, right? So maybe they might <laughs> appreciate knowing that up front. Any other questions?
Hi, good evening. Thank you for those amazing ideas. So uh, I'm still a student myself, but when I think about my home country and like we're all about women in tech, I feel that there are a lot of smaller cities where a lot of girls don't have access to quality education maybe, so they don't have somebody teaching them math or science with the right concepts. It's like being rote learning or something. So they lose their passion and then it is anyways like the stereotype, the male's domain. So I feel a lot of people with the aptitude are lost at a young stage. So how would you say engage in an audience of say young teenage girls who you know, like I, I started liking science when I saw the Flintstones cartoon, thinking that maybe I could build the future someday. But like, in your opinion, what could be a good way to gauge a somebody's aptitude or interest so you can like help him further, her further, and uh, also like maybe get them interested or on board to you know uh, explore sciences, maths, or anything in tech further for a younger audience. Actually, I can completely relate to you because I am also from a third world country and I there are very less access to women who wants to pursue even their career or studies. But uh, you, you're right because, you know, tech awareness is very important. You aware them about technology and conducting these sessions which can aware them that this is, uh, you know, technology is, how it's growing. And then obviously they can be able to, if they feel related to it or they want to do something like that. So awareness is very important because when I started my bachelor's, I didn't know that this is something which is I'm really going to pursue my whole life and something which is I'm passionate about it. So when I started, then I realized that it is something which I want to do for my life. So... I think awareness, creating such awareness campaigns and telling them that if they get excited about technology, uh, you can see there's some interest in them. Uh, eventually, people get to know that uh, where they kind of feel more interested. Thank you for that. Um, sorry, you have a... Um, okay, I think one thing that I've noticed that really helps, and um, like I was just uh, last weekend, I was um, in an event called She Hacks, where we had like nine to twelve year olds uh, girls who were trying to you know build something. It was a two day hackathon, um, and I think one thing I realized is that a community helps a lot. So for young girls and even for us, right? Like if we feel that we find people around us who want to do the same thing or who are in it like, okay, so let's build something together. That really helps versus just one or two people doing it. So I think if you ever find someone who has the aptitude or at least even just wants to know, like getting them in a community really helps. Like getting like at least like nine to 10 of them together and giving them some problem to solve. And then, you know, when they achieve it together, I think that's when they feel, okay, yes, this is not hard. And not just that, they feel like a sense of accomplishment. So I think that needs to happen early on to believe that, yes, you can do it. And at the same time, have the interest in it. Because I think the reason people leave it is because either they find it, okay, either it's too difficult to understand or it's like, okay, you know, and sometimes you're like, okay, it's too much science. Like I can't really relate it to anything around me. Uh, so I think for, especially for little girls, I think it's very important and boys, like it's really important that you get them in a community where those people also want to, you know, hack out stuff, try out stuff. And it could be very simple things, right? Uh, but I think getting people around you who are similar minded would really help you push that through. Uh, so I feel like just getting a few of them together is the right way to go about it, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I really want to thank everybody. Okay, one last question. Go for it. So uh, as you were asking for the event, so we used to organize an event for small girls in India. So you don't focus on the learning, just... Uh, just, you know, help them to be excited about the subject. So we used to invite them to our college, university, and we used to ask from every department like chemistry, physics, to show some interesting experiments, just to make them feel. And then we will tell our stories that even we never did it before. We never touched chemicals before. When we came here, we did it. So it also really helped a lot uh, them to be excited about the subjects and be confident that in the future they can also take these subjects as a career. So you can organize these one hour, two hour events and can ask them to come regularly or monthly to see some experiments. Those are doable. Yeah. Great stuff. Thank you for sharing and thank the panel for sharing. Thank you very much. 
and um, feel free to approach the, the speakers and there's uh, uh, all the speakers with the blue bags they have spoken before feel free to ask any of them about their experiences and just uh, even if you want to ask more personal questions that's the time <laughs> and there's still food uh, outside so feel free mingle around this is a time that we actually celebrate you know it's international women's day everybody have fun okay great stuff and last and not least after this session, I expect every single one to submit a proposal. <laughs> Don't just submit one, submit as many as possible. You know, whatever uh, project that you have, if you have worked on five projects, submit five proposals on all five projects. It'll be great stuff. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you.